All right, we've got a long exercise to get through, so let's get started. Um, we need to find the interior, exterior, and boundary of each of three these three sets. So we need to find like nine things. Okay, so we're going to call these sets A, B, and C. All right. So for A, um, what we're going to prove is, let's see here, so this is... Sometimes we'll call this the ball of radius 1 centered at the point x. This is, no. Actually, no, I'm not, because typically ball of radius 1 centered at the point x is all x and rn such that the norm of x is strictly less than 1. And we're going to prove that b1 of x is the interior of a and uh, we'll go from there but anyways um, so we're going to start with that so we want to prove that b1 of x is the interior of a so what that means is given any x in b1x we want to prove that there's a neighborhood around that po uh, an open rectangle around that point contained in A, and yeah, that's that's the only thing that we need. All right, so if the norm of X is less than one, okay, how are we going to choose this neighborhood? Um, choose delta greater than zero such that delta is also going to be less than, um, need to be less than or less than or equal to um, this needs to be less than well I guess it doesn't really matter because it's going to turn into less than anyways so anyways 1 minus the norm of X this is a positive number because the norm of X is less than 1 and we're going to divide by the square root of n and so this delta that I've chosen here, first of all, this is going to come up a lot in these exercises. This whole you take some you take some distance or you take something and you divide by the square root of n. Um, and you don't really it's not clear that you should do this beforehand. So to find this, I've sort of worked backwards. Um, and so we'll see how that works. And let you be product from i equals 1 to n of xi minus delta xi plus delta. So this is an open rectangle around x and each the, the index or the open interval in each um, coordinate is given by xi minus delta xi plus delta. Okay we want to prove okay certainly x is contained in u but we need to prove that u is contained in a. So, to prove that, let's choose any y in u. We have the following. The norm of y equals norm of y minus x plus x. And we use a triangle inequality, so this is less than or equal to this norm plus this norm. Okay, so now... The norm of y minus x is, by definition, you take the sum from i equals 1 to n of yi minus xi, square it, then you take the square root at the very end, and then we still have the norm of x here. Okay, but we've proven that each, okay, so um, y is in u, so yi must be in the interval xi minus delta, xi plus delta. So the distance between xi and yi has to be less than delta because delta is the radius of each interval in each index. So this is less than or equal to get the sum from i equals 1 to n and instead of yi minus xi we have delta and it's being squared and we take the square root at the very end we add the norm of x. Okay, so um, what this is, we're taking delta squared and summing it up n times. So we just get n 
So n delta squared to the 1 half plus the norm of x. So this is just delta times the square root of n plus the norm of x. But remember, we chose delta to be less than this weird fraction thing. So delta is less than um, Let's see here. So I'm actually going to put the, just to make this a little easier, I'm going to put the square root of n in front. So we're going to have the square root of n times 1 minus the norm of x divided by the square root of n plus x. We've just used our inequality of delta. And so the square roots of n cancel, and so we get 1 minus the norm of x plus the norm of x, but this is 1. And this holds for every single y in u. So any y in u has norm strictly less than 1. And so that means, let's see, you're actually going back here. Um, this distance is technically strictly less than. It doesn't really matter because if it's strictly less than, then it's also less than or equal to. Um, but yeah, it can't be on the endpoint, so it's going to be strictly less than. But anyways, that's not what's important. What's important is that the norm of y is going to be strictly less than 1, and this holds for all y and u. So x is in u, and u is contained in a. So thus, let's see here. I guess that this is technically, what this technically shows us is that the set of all points x and rn, I'm just going to write the norm of x here. I'll, I'll write it the first time and then I'll just use this notation. In the future, I'm just going to, I'm not going to write no x in rn such that because I'll just imply that anytime I wrote something like norm of x is less than one and you ask where is x x is going to be in rn okay so this is contained in the interior of a I guess we haven't technically proven that any point in the interior also has norm less than one Although I suppose that wouldn't be too difficult to prove. You could probably just use this argument. Like, if x is in the interior of A, then there is a neighborhood around it, um, and the neighborhood needs to be contained in A. Um, so for every single value in A, I guess it's not, I don't know. It might take a little bit more work, but I don't think we need it actually. Um, and I'll show you why. So the interior of A could, so just from this argument, it could technically be possible that the interior of A contains more elements besides, or contain things outside of the set norm of x less than 1. Um, we're going to prove that that's not the case, but the way we're going to do that is we're going to prove that every other point is somewhere else. So... Now, if the norm of x is greater than 1, we're going to prove that x is in the exterior of A. And we're going to do a very similar argument. Choose 0. Delta is going to be between 0 and, again, norm of x minus 1 over square root of n. So we're just flipping it. Let u equal, again, pi, or the direct product from i equals 1 to n, xi minus delta, xi plus delta. Then I'm just going to start with the norm of y. This is, at the end I'll write that this holds for all y and u. 
but I don't want to write it beforehand because then I'd have to use another line to write this equation, and that's a lot of work. Okay, so we're going to do this is y minus x plus x. Now we're using the reverse triangle inequality. So this is greater than or equal to the norm of y minus x minus the norm of x. And so we actually want to um, rewrite this. This is the same as this because you can flip the order of things that you're subtracting in an absolute value because it's an absolute value. So flipping the order of things you're subtracting only, can, only changes the sign and the sign doesn't matter in absolute value. Okay, and so this is going to be greater than or equal to the norm of x minus the norm of y minus x. And that's true because, well, it's either going to be equal or, so x, Basically, this thing inside the absolute value on the left here, the norm of norm of x minus norm of x minus y, that the thing on the inside is either going to be positive or negative. If it's positive, this inequality is equal. If it's negative, then this we have strict inequality trivially because we have something positive on the left and something negative on the right. So these triangle inequalities are sort of weird because it's some of these things look sort of like obvious and you're not using a lot of... Um, it doesn't. It seems like it's it works too well to be useful, but it is useful, and we're going to see that here. So, anyways, we can replace the norm of x minus y with the formula for it, which is the sum from y equals one to n x i minus y i squared. We take the square root, and then we do the same thing that we did um, before. However, now before we had these uh, the sum of these things and this was less than delta squared. Each xi minus yi squared is strictly less than delta squared. Here, there's a minus on this entire term and so the inequality goes the other way. So this is strictly greater than norm of x minus sum from i equals one to n delta squared, taking the square root, and we sort of know where this is going this is norm of x minus, then we'll have the square root of n times delta. And this is, because delta is less than that thing that I wrote before, minus this thing times delta is going to be greater than um, our bound for delta. So let's see here, we have norm of x minus 1 over square root of n. So this is norm of x minus norm of x plus 1, which is 1. For all y in u, so x is in u, which is contained in the set of points x in Rn such that the norm of x is strictly greater than 1, but notice that this is just the complement of A. Thus, we've proven that the, all points of this form are contained in the exterior of A. Having done this argument, it is technically possible that the exterior of A is bigger, but we're going to prove that that's not the case by sort of a process of elimination. Okay, so finally suppose norm of x equals 1 let u be pi equals 1 to n ai bi b I'll just call it a neighborhood of x, and what this means is that it's just an open rectangle containing x. So for every single i from 1 to n, a, x i is strictly between a i and b i.
let yi be some element between ai and xi. Then if we let y be the vector formed by taking y1 through yn, the norm of y is going to be just, we take the sum from i equals 1 to n of yi squared, take the square root, and yi squared is going to be strictly less than xi squared, because each a because yi is less than xi. So this is less than um, the sum from y equals 1 to n, xi squared, square root, but this is precisely the norm of x. And the norm of x equals 1. So that tells us that y is an a, because a contains all vectors with norms strictly less than 1. So then we'll let zi be an element of xi to bi. Then again we let z be the vector formed by taking z1 through zn, and this is again going to be you take the square root sum from i equals 1 to n, this is bugging me, zi squared, one half, and each zi is greater than xi. So this is greater than, sum from i equals 1 to n, xi squared, square root equals norm of x, which equals 1. So z is not in um, a. So what we've proven is that for every for every point x with norm 1, for every neighborhood of that point, that neighborhood contains bo points both in A and not in A. Oh wait, why did I, why did I, why did I find Y here then? Because if we want to point in A, we could just use X itself. So I guess that was unnecessary, so sorry about that. Um, but what this proves is thus, um, the norm of x equals 1, this is contained in the boundary of A. Okay, so hence, okay, so what, what can we do now? Well now, we've proven that if we take any vector x, x, if norm of x is less than 1, it's in the interior. If it's equal to 1, it's in the boundary. If it's greater than 1, it's in the exterior. Um, so that covers all possible points in Rn. So remember before we said that the that the set of points where the norm of x is strictly less than 1 is contained in the interior of A. However, if the norm of x is equal to 1, then it's in the boundary and not in and thus not in the interior. If its norm is greater than 1, then it's in the exterior and thus not in the interior. So you can't have any point whose norm is not less than 1 and also in the interior. So that's how we that's how we change this containment to equality. So interior of A not only contains norm of x less than 1, it's precisely equal to norm of x less than 1. We have exterior of A equals norm of x greater than 1. And uh, the boundary of A equals norm of x equals 1. All right, so for B, so now we're looking at B, remember, is a set of all points with norm precisely equal to 1. Let norm of x be less than 1. Um, by part A, by our argument from before, 
we know that there exists an open rectangle U containing X such that the norm of Y is less than 1 for all U in Y. No, for all Y in U. So this tells us that for any point with norm less than 1, there is a neighborhood around that point which does not intersect B. So norm of X less than 1 is contained in the interior, no, exterior of B. And likewise, The set of all points with norm of x greater than 1 is contained in exterior of B. And this is because if you choose a point x whose norm is strictly greater than 1, we proved before that there is a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood around x such that all points in that neighborhood have norms strictly greater than 1. So this open neighborhood of x lies entirely outside of B and so that's what it means for x to be in the exterior of b. This holds whenever norm of x is greater than 1, and so the set of all points where the norm of x is greater than 1 is contained in the exterior of b. All right. So next, if norm of x equals 1, then um, by A, any neighborhood of X contains points here, I'll write it like this. Any neighborhood of X contains a point y with norm of y greater than 1. And certainly x is in. Okay, so norm of y is greater than 1, so y is not in b. And certainly x is going to be both in the neighborhood but also in B. So x is in the boundary of B. And this holds for any x with norm 1. And so norm of x equals 1 is contained in the boundary of B. I probably should have mentioned this before. This, um, this sort of derivative looking symbol, this is a pretty standard notation to use to refer to the boundary of a set. I don't think it's used in this textbook, but I'm going to use it. And then for interior and exterior, I'm just going to use int parentheses and ext parentheses. All right, so we're just about done with this. Um, So, interior of B, well, if you take any point X, um, if its norm is equal to 1, then it's in the boundary. If its norm is either greater than 1 or less than 1, that's in the exterior. And so it can't possibly in the, be in the interior. So the in interior is the empty set. Um, the exterior of B equals you take all points with norm less than one and you take the union with all points greater than one because we've shown that all that both of these sets are contained in the exterior and um, boundary of B is precisely B. All right. 
Um, and yeah, that's all we need to prove. Again, we get these equalities because um, we get the containment from the arguments that we've given, and after having accounted for all possible um, points in Rn, you can then get the other containment. Because, for example, for to prove that um, any element of the uh, exterior of B is in the, the union of these two sets, um, any point not in these two, we know that these two sets are contained in the exterior, and any point not in those two sets must be in the set of points norm x equal to 1. But that's precisely the boundary of B. And we know that the boundary, the interior, and the exterior are always all disjoint from each other. And so any point with norm 1 cannot be in the exterior. And so you get equality there. All right, and so now we can move on to C. And this is, so B was sort of similar to A, and C is very different. And this is also an interesting exercise. Um, remember, C is the set of all vectors in Rn such that all so here, I'll just write a reminder. It's set of all x and rn such that each index xi is a rational number. And we need to prove facts about r. And I feel like these are facts that might have been covered in a linear algebra course, like an abstract linear algebra course, but they might not have, because they're not necessary for a linear algebra course. Um, these are things that are useful as an introduction to pure mathematics. Um, but otherwise, the place where you really see them and where they're really emphasized is in a first course in real analysis, such as baby Rudin, um, Principles of Mathematical Analysis. So... I'm not, we're not assuming that the audience has any prior knowledge of facts about real numbers. So let's prove a few things first. So let A and B be real numbers such that A is less than B. So then what I claim first is that there exists a rational number which is between A and B, and yeah, like I said, also a rational number. To prove this, choose an integer n which is strictly greater than 1 over B minus A. Then if we look at the distance between Bn and An, well this is n times B minus A, and n is greater than 1 over b minus a, so that will be greater than b minus a over b minus a, which is 1. So the distance between bn and an is greater than 1. So there exists an integer m such that an is strictly less than bm, which is less than bn. This has to be true because the distance between a n and b n is greater than 1. So a is less than m over n, which is less than b. All right. And certainly m over n is a rational number because it's an integer divided by an integer. And so, there we go. To prove there is an irrational number, number which is between A and B, so I'll just say that's in the open interval from A to B. Let Q1 be a rational number between A and B, which we've proven exists, 
A and B, we said they were real numbers, but we didn't say anything about whether or not they're rational or irrational. And it turns out it doesn't matter by our proof. So regardless of what A and B look like, Q1 is a rational number between them. So it's rational. And we'll let Q2 be a rational number, which is between Q1 and B. And the reason we're doing this is because this proof of an irrational, we end up proving that there is an, an irrational number between two rational numbers. And you sort of have to combine that with the fact that there is a rational between any two reals to prove that there is an irrational between any two reals. Okay, so Q1 and Q2 are both between A and B, but Q1 is less than Q2. So now we're going to set R to be Q1 plus Q2 divided by the square root of 2. And here we're just choosing the, the denominator. All we really need is a, um, in the denominator, is an irrational number greater than 1. All right, and so square root of 2 will work. Um, so if we choose this, because that gives us, yeah. So anyways, then this will give us that R is between Q1 and Q2. And, Q, and this interval is contained in AB. R is irrational, so it's in R but not in Q. Because if R were in Yeah, if R were rational, then, okay, so we have R equals Q1 plus Q2 over the square root of 2. Let's move, let's multiply both sides by square root of 2 and divide both sides by R. So we'll get square root of 2 on the left side. Then we'll get Q1 plus Q2 over R on the right side. And if R is rational, then we're adding two rationals and then dividing by rational, which will give us a rational. This is false because we chose, because square root of 2 is not a rational number. So, between any two reals, is both irrational and irrational number. In fact, there are num or there are many, obviously, but that's not important. So finally, let x be an element in Rn and x be in a neighborhood u. So let u be an open neighborhood of x and this is just going to be ai, bi, take the direct product of all of these. For all i, Choose QI and RI, which are between AI and BI, such that QI is in Q and RI is in the irrationals. Then Q is in U. And it's also in C because all of its indices are rational. Q is, of course, the vector Q1 through Qn. And R is also in U, but it's not in C because it has an index which is irrational. In fact, all of its indices are irrational. So it wasn't absolutely necessary to make all of the um, indices irrational, but it was 
fast enough to write it out. So, any neighborhood of X has points both in U and not, no, both in, yes, every neighborhood U of X has points both in C and not in C. So, X is in the boundary of C, so the boundary of C contains Rn. Okay, but then that, that's it, because Rn is everything. So hence, the boundary of C is, must be precisely equal to Rn, and both the interior and exterior of C must be empty, because there is nothing left over. And this is a little weird when you think about it the first time, um, but when you reflect on it a little bit more, it sort of starts to make sense. And also, even if it seems counterintuitive, you can look at the proof and see that the proof is valid. Um, so yeah, anyways, that was, a, that, that was three sets we had to find the interior exterior boundary for, and we did it, and so now we're done.